This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I'm pleased to have Anthony Todd on my podcast today. Anthony is Chief Executive Officer of Aspect Capital, one of the most successful managed futures trend-following firms in the world. Anthony co-founded Aspect in September 1997. Before that, he was with AHL, another famed managed futures trend-following firm. I'm lucky to have some of the most successful and brightest trend-following traders and managers on my show. I hope you enjoy this conversation. (music) Digging through your philosophical statement, your investment philosophy, just your, your opening piece that you have online that everyone can read. And I want to break it apart two ways first, but I would love for you, the one part was this aspect's belief is that market prices are not random. I would love for you to explain that and and let the audience know when did you know deep in your gut? I know it was a long time ago, but when did you know that deep in your gut, wow, my entire career is now going to be built on something that goes entirely against academic orthodoxy, uh, financial orthodoxy. I mean, you you knew a long time ago that you were going a different direction. I was at um, Oxford and read physics with Michael Adam and Marty Lewick, the A and the L of, of AHL. And actually, right at the very start of my financial career, um, I went into the fixed income market. Um, I joined a firm called Phillips & Drew, which was then kind of taken over by UBS. Um, I was partly on the, on the sales side and, and also on the, and then on the sales trading side on, you know, at, um, at what was then UBS, Phillips & Drew. Um, so, if, so my starting point in, in finance was very much, uh, if you like, you know, the traditional approach to you know, fundamental uh, analysis and trading of the markets. Now, meanwhile, actually, Mike, um, Adam, and Marty Lewick, um, right from university, right from Oxford, um, they kind of set off and joined Michael Adam's father's firm and actually started building models, building trend-following models to beat the markets. So, actually, during the 1980s, uh, Mike and Marty, and of course, they were then joined by, you know, by David Harding when they kind of founded together AHL in 1987, they were kind of constantly saying to me, you know, you know, Anthony, you've, you know, look at what we're actually kind of doing. The markets are not random. The markets are not random. The markets, there are inefficiencies. The markets, we've actually identified a key inefficiency, which is the tendency for markets to trend, the tendency for markets to display serial autocorrelation. And really, kind of during the 1980s, the more and more I could look at it, the more and more I saw the results that they were generating, the more <laughs> persuaded I became. But it took me until... In 1992, it wasn't actually until 1992 that um, I actually kind of took the decision to actually kind of go and join uh, AHL. So it wasn't a case of suddenly a, you know, a light bulb moment. It was very much one of just looking at the contract record, listening to what, you know, to, you know, to what um, the kind of models, learning about the models that they were actually kind of building. Um, and finally, the, just the evidence became overwhelming that they were actually onto something um, and that they were actually able to exploit this persistent driver of market behavior. And had it been exciting, because this, th- these ideas, and there was other, other traders in parallel, perhaps unconnected in, in America and around the world, but it had been terribly exciting to realize, wow, we've found this inefficiency that the, the academic financial community just doesn't, they don't think it exists. No, it's, um, it, that's, that's exactly the point. I mean, at you know, that stage, and this was, I suppose, kind of great excitement for me, was the idea that um, you could apply a scientific approach, you could apply scientific principles, you could apply technology to beat the markets. And you could think back in the 1980s, um, academic thinking was very much kind of based around uh, the efficient market um, hypothesis, and the majority of practitioners in financial markets thought it was impossible um, to actually beat the markets. And so I said that actually, of course, the evidence um, of, you know, of a number of, um, of systematic traders during the 1970s and 1980s, but I had to bear in mind that during the 1980s, the CTA sector was still a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the alternative investment universe. 
Um, but the, you know, the returns that they were generating just flew in the face of the efficient market theory. And as I said, the, you know, the evidence just became overwhelming that it actually, it was possible to beat the markets. It was possible to apply scientific principles to beat the markets. Um, so that it was at that point that I decided to, you know, to join um, AHL. Let me, let me read this statement in full now, though. Aspects believe that market prices are not random, but display persistent, statistically measurable, and predictable behavior and idiosyncrasies. T- talk about the word predictable for a second, because I think some people could be listening, or they could see that statement. They, well, well, Anthony and, and Aspect, uh, these guys can predict market returns. That's not what you're saying. What I'm, what I'm saying is that that there is that the markets at a high level, at a first approximation, um, actually, I think the efficient market theory is a reasonable. It's a reasonable theory about of market behavior, um, but only at a very, very, very kind of first level of, um, of approximation. Um, actually, if you could delve far more kind of deeply, um, my belief and the, the belief on which, first of all, you know, AHL was founded on then on which we kind of founded Aspect, um, is that actually there are persistent drivers of market behavior. Um, the, these drivers of market behavior, they enable you to actually gain a very small but statistically significant um, edge in the markets. Now, market by market, if we apply one of our models to one market um, over a very extended period, the edge we might have would be infinitesimal. But apply that edge um, appropriately kind of risk-managed across multiple time frequencies, across multiple markets, then one actually has something which can actually generate um, persistent uh, performance over an extended time period. So, no, and, and, no, do, no do we actually can see that we've actually, that we can actually can predict behavior in an individual market or even predict behavior in an individual um, sector? No, I would say that's actually kind of not the case. And, you know, constantly, um, you know, I'm asked sometimes by clients or prospective clients, which direction do we think the stock market's going in? What direction do we think bond markets are going in? Um, the point is that our positions, the position we take in the market, is completely path dependent. And so although I can tell you today what position we might have in the S&P, what position we might have in fixed income markets, actually tomorrow or next week or next month, that position might be entirely different. That's difficult, I think, for clients and people that want to understand your style of trading because they want to know this static position, whereas if they if they don't understand the complexity and the totality of the model, knowing a static position is almost useless. Yeah, um, I, and I think that's a, that's a very accurate observation, and, and I think that very much kind of demonstrates the, the difference between a discretionary kind of macro approach and you know, a, you know, a systematic, um, much more kind of price-driven type of approach. That you know, I'd actually got very much looked at on the basis that, you know, of course, there are um, you know, many successful, deeply kind of successful kind of macro managers out there um, who will take a view on the global economy and will actually kind of identify a small number, typically a small number of high-conviction, concentrated kind of trades in the markets. Um, and that's really kind of what many... Investors for years and years and years, they can understand that approach, they associate with that approach. But I think what we've actually kind of seen is kind of quite a shift over the course of the last kind of 15 or 20 years, and certainly in the time that I've actually kind of been doing this, that, it, that investors can now actually kind of understand that actually crowd behavior does drive trends, it drives momentum, it drives serial laws correlation in the markets. And that is a, a very persistent effect. You can look at markets over the course of the last 10 years, over the course of the last 50 years, over the last 100 years, over the last 200 years, and actually you can see this you know, persistent driver exhibiting itself in, you know, in the markets. Now, if one can actually capture that effect across multiple time frequencies and across many, many, many kind of different diversifying markets, that actually enables us to actually create um, consistent performance for our, for our clients over an extended time period. Anthony, I know you have an agnostic approach to the idea of asset price fundamentals, intrinsic value. Do you still find there's some some misconceptions? Yes, I mean, there there are still going to be misconceptions there. I mean, you know, the first thing is to say is that um, in in terms of the balance of our trading models, 80% of the risk that that we apply in the markets, we apply to a pure 
trend following approach um, and again we can talk a little bit later about what we mean by trend following what we mean by medium term now actually from 20 percent um, of the risk um, that we actually actually allocate in the markets we allocate to what we would term uh, modulating factors now those modulating factors might actually exploit more fundamental type type approach they might exploit factors such as um, value, relative value, carry, relative carry, and seasonality. So, in fact, um, you know, I would say that you know those are, those are kind of factors that's not a primary driver of what we do, uh, but it's certainly an adjunct. We can certainly see that factors such as those can actually complement our trend following approach. Do you systematize those factors? Com- those are completely systematized. Those are one hundred percent systematized. Everything we actually can do, I and mean, clearly, there's a huge amount of discretion that goes into the design of the models, the inputs into the models, and how we actually parameterize the models, how we know what um, avenues of research we're going to explore. But once a model has been appropriately researched, it's then implemented with 100% discipline. Yeah, not trying to save myself from making a bad assumption, but I think it's a, it's a pretty clear distinction that using fundamentals in a systematic way is much different than I think a typical way someone might understand the use of fundamentals. It's using different data, but it's still a model. Yes, that is, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. And again, it comes down to you know what I was saying a little bit earlier, because Michael, you know, what we're actually trying to do, you know, is and that's what I'm saying. If markets display persistent, statistically measurable, predictable behavior and idiosyncrasies. Um, so what we're trying to do is actually identify those underlying drivers of market behavior. Now, one of the most persistent drivers of market behavior that we've identified is the tendency for crowd behavior to drive trends. But clearly, there are other factors that play in the markets as well. Um, and those um, sometimes can actually have work when trend following is not working. Um, sometimes they can actually, as I said, complement, be an adjunct, they actually reinforce you know, our trend following compositions. So, you know, what we are doing in our main flagship program is applying around 15 to 20 different underlying models. The bulk of them, the bulk of them are price driven. 80% of our risk is in the medium term trend following approach. But we do also exploit some more fundamental value carry type um, factors at the same time. Since you brought it up and I was going to go there. Why don't you define your style of trend following, this medium-term trend following? Why don't you define that for the audience? Yeah, I mean, you know, for us, medium-term, we would actually kind of characterize as becoming trends that last for um, two to three months or longer. That's almost the, the, the sweet spot in terms of length of trend that we're actually kind of looking for. Now, how do we actually capture trends like that, um, trends that length, uh, what we do is we actually deploy seven different uh, price filters. Um, our fastest kind of price filter will be trying to identify trends in the markets over a period of one to two weeks. Our slowest um, trend following model will be looking to identify trends over a period of six months or longer. We have a greater weight towards the slower frequencies. So in aggregate, in aggregate, um, we're trying to identify trends over a period of at least two to three months. But once again, that illustrates a level of diversification. So I said, I mean, actually, you know, we diversify very heavily across markets. We're trading around 200 different contracts in 180 different futures markets worldwide. So there's a huge level of diversification by market. There's a huge level of diversification by trade frequency. I wrote down a quote before our conversation today from your colleague, Martin. It's less about the genius of the trade and more about the repeatability of the approach. And I think so many people, they fall in love with the news stories. They hear about the, you know, the guy that just, the guy or the gal that just made the big trade. They got on the, for example, Soros back in the day on the British pound. They just made the right decision on the one thing, the one home run. Whereas your approach, it's about a process. It's not about trying to hit a home run on some one trade. It's about grinding this process through and ending up with results at the end, but it's about a process. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that, that is, that is exactly right. And that's why I would compare and contrast our approach with, you know, many, but not all, you know, you know genius macro traders. And clearly there are a number of them around. You mentioned, you know, George Soros calling the, um, uh, calling the kind of pound correctly, um, you know, back in the early 1990s. A trader like that is actually can trying to identify 
a very small number of concentrated high conviction trades. Now, for us, what we're actually kind of trying to do is exploit, in fact, a tiny edge in the markets. And we actually kind of do that by applying that tiny edge across multiple time frequencies and across as many different markets as we possibly can and actually controlling risk you know, very, very tightly. So the two approaches are, are very different. They can at times be kind of correlated with each other. But in general, uh, you know, what we are going to be doing is you know, exploiting um, a, a very small edge across many different markets you know, at the same time. Running our profits, cutting our losses, that's the nature of a, of a trend-following approach. Trend-following approach is, is self-correcting in, you know, in that way. Whereas, obviously, you know, many macro traders, if a trade is actually, if they see that if they've put on a trade because it represents attractive value, if the price of that individual kind of asset actually kind of falls, it tends to will be to, or buy more of it, and buy more of it, and buy more of it, and actually kind of build up um, the position. We won't be doing that. Um, our, position, our approach will be very different from that. As a price actually moves against us, and the trend actually starts reversing, we'll be scaling back our position. Talking about your trend following strategy, and you've got this diversified portfolio, how long can you be in a particular market in your tracking portfolio, in a trade? How long can you be in a particular market and not make money at it? I mean, how, how before you give up on it? Well, the, it, the first thing to say is we've actually, we've never dropped a market from the portfolio you know, because of not actually making money in it. So again, it comes back to our hypothesis about the markets. You know, markets and market trends, they are unpredictable. Trends are episodic in, in markets. And so there are actually a number of markets that we've actually traded over the course of the last 10 years where we have made no returns like our clients in those markets for a 10-year period. From our perspective, that has no bearing. That a, a, is a poor indicator of what might happen over the next 10 years. And the analogy, well, not the analogy, the, the example I'd give of that is if you look over the course last, in fact, over the course last 10, 20, 30 years, a significant kind of part of the returns that we've actually come generated has come from being long in the fixed income markets. And of course, what we've actually kind of seen since 1982 is, is the most remarkable kind of trend um, in fixed income markets on a global level. That has been a major kind of driver of trend-following returns. That's for us and for the CTA sector in general. But just because we've actually made strong returns in the fixed income markets over a 30-year period, that to us is completely irrelevant in terms of how we should position the kind of portfolio, how we should allocate risk over the course of the next 5, 10, 20, or 30 years. So in terms of um, markets, we would, we would drop markets for a number of reasons if we actually suddenly saw liquidity drying up in the markets, um, if we actually kind of suddenly saw that there was a potentially... I mean, it could be a kind of counterparty risk um, in the markets. Um, if there was some kind of regulatory risk in the markets, that might actually um, result in us actually dropping the market. Um, but over well, my, you know, my career in, 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 in trend following and managed futures, we've never dropped the market because of you know, you know, for, for the reason of actually kind of losing money or not making money in that market. Anthony, have you found over the years that client understandings of the concept of a trend following drawdown, have, have client understandings increased to the point where they they get why they're, they're there's, there's no free lunch. The, the equity curve doesn't go up in a straight line. Have have you seen a transition there, or is it still something where you have to spend significant time to get people educated to what the the risks are and the benefits? I think I mean things have have changed. Very dramatically, I mean, over the course of the last you know, kind of 20 years, you know, when I started working in the managed futures kind of sector you know, back in the very early 1990s, there was minimal institutional um, interest in the sector. The, you know, the sector was actually very much, uh, um, you know, the products were very much designed with a, with a retail audience, with a high net worth investor audience in mind. Fees were very high. Guaranteed products, principal protected products were very standard. The, as a result of the fees being, being very high, the products were highly leveraged, volatility was very high, there was no transparency. Now, institutions confronted with a, with a product like that, institutions just had no interest of any sort whatsoever. They couldn't, because there was no transparency, they couldn't actually understand the program, they had no interest in it. The, the, really, the, the big driver of growth 
in, in the sector um, during the course of the last decade has been um, pension funds, endowments, insurance companies, um, ERISA plans, um, and, um, and banks. Now, they've actually, kind of, I think, identified, and this is one of the, you know, one of the drivers behind setting up Aspect, you know, back in 1997, was in, an increasing number of institutional investors could actually see that under the hood of, of this, you know, high fee kind of product, here was actually kind of something that had the diversification benefits they were looking for. It was highly uncorrelated with stock markets, bond markets, anything else in their kind of portfolio. Um, but at the appropriate level of fees and the appropriate level of transparency, it was exactly the kind of program they should be looking for. So what we saw, I think, during the period from, I'd say, kind of 2000 through to come kind of 2010 was a huge amount of, of, of institutional interest um, in the managed futures kind of sector and a, a, a significant increase in the level of understanding. So yes, the level of understanding now, it's, it's night and day by comparison with, with what it was come 20 years or so ago. On the other hand, what we also saw is that post-2008, 2008 was, of course, almost the perfect storm for the managed futures sector. A high degree of, of crowd behavior driving strong trends across multiple timeframes and across multiple markets. Now, after 2008, that performance actually created a huge level of demand for managed futures from a number of investors who, who simply did not understand the space. So money kind of poured into the sector during the course of two, really come 2010, 11, 12, and then following the somewhat disappointing returns over that period, a lot of that money has actually been washed out again. It's a tricky thing. I think so many, so many folks that really don't take the time to understand the types of strategies that your firm employs, they want to jump in and out. They, they don't really take the time to wrap their arms around it. But as you say, the smart investors are taking the time today. I have a question. The notion of crisis alpha, how do you feel about this phraseology? I don't like that kind of terminology, you know, because I think it's, so yes, absolutely, kind of managed futures has this kind of reputation. I mean, quite justifiably, it has a you know, kind of strong reputation and strong track record in being able to generate uncorrelated returns during times of crisis, hence the name you know, kind of crisis alpha. So you, know, you look at periods such as 1987, you look at 1998, you look at the tech wreck in 2000, 2003, you look at the GFC in 2008, and time and again, managed futures has been able to kind of generate exactly the type of strong, diversifying returns that the clients are looking for. So you can, on the one hand, one can argue, well, that, that term kind of crisis alpha is, is, you know, is well justified. But I think what it overlooks is the fact that if you actually kind of look in more benign market environments, so if you think back to um, the period 1995, 1997, um, very you know, so-called Goldilocks economy, not too hot, not too cold, um, soaring kind of stock markets, um, and a great deal of stability in actual kind of in, in global markets, managed futures generated very significant back-to-back year-on-year returns. Fast forward another 10 years, 2005, 2007, you know, as the world actually kind of came out of the tech wreck, and post come 2003, once again, we saw kind of a period of actually very benign market conditions. Chancellor here in the UK actually kind of saying that, claiming that uh, we'd actually, he'd actually kind of seen the end of the kind of boom and bust environment. And once again, in that, in those market conditions, trend following was able to generate sustained, consistent returns. So, I think that, that, yes, absolutely, kind of managed futures has a very strong track record of being able to provide diversifying returns, if you like, crisis, alpha, and a difficult market environment. But in addition, but in addition, it has a strong contract record of being able to kind of generate attractive returns in more benign market environments. And that, to me, is one of the kind of crucial elements which is often overlooked in trend following. It's not a case that trend following is um, negatively correlated with stock markets or negatively correlated with bonds. The correlation is variable. If when stock markets are falling, if, if they go through a sustained fall, then absolutely you'd expect a trend following model to actually be short of stock markets and to be generating negatively correlated performance. But in a rising stock market environment, the reverse should be true. You know, our trend following models should be able to latch on to that rising trend and you'd expect our performance actually to be positively correlated with stock markets. Over the long term, over the long, long, long term, you know, our returns tend to be zero correlated with stocks, zero kind of have zero correlation with kind of fixed income markets. But the, as I said, that correlation is variable. And to me, that's one of the 
most kind of persuasive arguments behind um, uh, trend following programs. Talk about the culture that you've built as the CEO of Aspect. What type of culture have you built at Aspect? I think we have built um, a culture which is you know, highly academic um, in, its, in its approach. But it's very important to actually apply that academic approach with a market awareness. So it's, it's crucial to actually kind of combine the two. So yes, if you look at our kind of research team, we have some of the world's kind of top flight kind of quants. But it's extremely important that the top of that um, research group, um, that it's actually kind of led by individuals who have a deep understanding of market behavior. So that's the first point. Academic, you know, academic discipline, a scientific approach informed by knowledge of market behavior. I'd also define that, you know, our approach as being one of collegiate. It's, you know, it's very collegiate. It's a very kind of open approach. One where there's a, there's a huge emphasis in terms of um, open communication, all of our researchers have open access to um, you know all the code across the entire company, have open access to all the models that we are researching and have ever researched. So you know we want an environment where you know everybody in the research team, everybody in the kind of business um, has complete clarity about our approach, has complete clarity, and has complete picture for how we're actually um, building our models and how we're trading in the markets. You know, I think we have a driven approach. We fully acknowledge we are in a highly, highly, highly competitive kind of marketplace. Uh, market conditions evolve. The competition is actually kind of very tough. Our clients kind of quite rightly are highly demanding. Um, and therefore, it is, it's, it's driven. It's very driven. It's, it's a, it's a kind of competitive atmosphere as well. Um, and also an environment where it, it's questioning and we're always kind of looking at um, how our models are actually kind of behaving. How can they actually could possibly be improved when research is actually conducted? It goes through an extended kind of peer review kind of process. There's constant challenge. There's kind of constant questioning about um, every step we take. You know, Anthony, I get a lot of emails over the years, and people, people out there, uh, they they look at a they look at a career, they look at some achievements, perhaps that you've had, and they they say, "Gee, I want to do that. I want to get to that position," but. I'm curious if you would give them the same advice that I often tell people. And I often say, listen, instead of spending six months or two years trying to find yourself one of the limited employee seats working for Anthony at Aspect, go at it alone. You've got, you've got a better shot. I mean, there's only so many seats that you have available at Aspect. And I'm curious if you would give the, the same advice to uh, would-be uh, traders, would-be investors that want to pursue your type of career path, that if they're, if they're better off just kind of going at it alone and giving it a shot that way. I mean, ultimately, that's what you did. Um, yes, it is. And so <laughs> I'm, going to give a slightly, I'm going to give a slightly counterintuitive, <laughs> counterintuitive reply to that. And I would say in today's market environment, my recommendation would be not to actually <laughs> take that step. The world was very different when, you know, when I joined AHL in 92, when I set up Aspect in 1997. Um, if you actually can look today at the levels of regulatory scrutiny, if you look at the levels of um, operational due diligence quite rightly demanded by institutions, the barriers to entry mm. um, to actually could build a sustainable business, they are far, 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 far greater than, than they were 15 years ago or 20 years ago. So whereas, you know, when we set off, you know, back in 1997, um, we started off with 50 million in, in seed capital, which was a, a significant kind of quantum of seed capital was more than enough uh, to actually kind of finance our research effort, our technology effort, our trading effort, um, and to actually kind of build a solid infrastructure. You know, to, today, I think kind of critical mass in really kind of setting up a business is near the 500 million to a billion mark. But the, you know, as a, you know, quite rightly now, quite rightly, you know, the regulations you know, demand high levels of kind of corporate governance. Um, frequently, when clients are undertaking uh, operational due diligence on us, um, they might send a, a team round to actually come see us for two or three days. Now, unless you've actually kind of got a, a significant investment in, in you know, an infrastructure to be able to kind of support that, you're always going to kind of fall at the first hurdle. So I think now, as I said, the barriers to entry are just far, 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 far too great. Um, so setting off by yourself these days, it's a, that's a tough proposition. 
Well, people will have to dig in and decide whether or not they want to go up against you and compete. Hey, I have one, I have one, <laughs> I have, I have one last, one last question. I'm curious, uh, mentors. I don't know. I'm guessing that you might say a lot of your mentors were your peer, your peer group, the, the folks that you mentioned, AHL, Martin. But did you have any specific mentors? And also just a big picture thing. Are there any favorite books from a, whether business books, philosophy books, non-trading books, things that you really enjoy that have inspired and influenced you as a CEO of a very significant sized fund? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, in, you know, in terms of, in terms of influences, I would say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm extremely kind of fortunate that I happen to be, you know, at university, you know, kind of studying physics with Marty Lewick and Michael Adam. And, you know, um, being able to kind of work with, you know, with Michael Adam and kind of Marty Lewick during the early 1990s. And then obviously kind of, you know, more recently, you're aware that, you know, Marty Lewick is our research director here. I'm, you know, very fortunate that they are, um, close friends of mine and I've, I've um, had a very successful working relationship with them. In terms of the books, the, I suppose the two books that immediately kind of spring to mind. I mean, it's a book actually that we always kind of give to everybody who joins the company, um, is the book Mania's Panics and Crashes, A History of Financial Crises. Um, so that book to me, if you want a single book that's going to really kind of illustrate um, how, how markets are, are not efficient, and how frequently one can actually kind of see manias and kind of panics and crashes. Uh, I, you know, I think that's absolutely kind of crucial reading. You know, in a similar vein, um, I'd look at the Reinhardt and Rogoff book. This time it's different. The, again, the, the, the four most dangerous words in finance. This, this time it's different. Um, and there, once again, just kind of looking at kind of history of financial kind of crises. It's these kind of crises that time and again just illustrate markets are not efficient. And it's that inefficiency um, which kind of generates opportunities for us to generate returns for our clients. Yeah, I've spoken to so many of your peers over the years. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you and I passed by each other at some location in some event. But I, I just love the honesty of this style of trading. There's something pure about it. That doesn't mean, oh, look, there's still a, look, everyone's a capitalist. Everyone's trying to do well, have a successful business. But when one really digs under the hood, there is something just honest about this style of trading. Comparatively to, we can all turn on the TV and there's someone trying to sell something. And frankly, some of those things just don't feel, they don't feel so nice. From you and a lot of your peers, there is something honest about this. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think there is. Um, and it kind of comes back to the point you were making earlier, uh, Michael, in terms of people's level of understanding with this. You know, whereas... 15 years ago, 20 years ago, people found it very difficult to actually understand what we do. And they said, look, you know, I can understand what a, you know, what a macro trader does. I can understand what a discretionary trader does. I can't understand what you're doing. It's, it's black box. Um, I think the world has turned on that now because in fact, what we do is highly intuitive. You can pick up the Wall Street Journal, pick up the Financial Times. You can look at how markets have behaved over the course of the previous few days or weeks. And intuitively, you'd be able to kind of guess exactly what direction would be the positions that we're holding in many of the markets we're actually kind of trading. And you can't say that for, for a discretionary macro trader. So yes, I think there is something very honest about what we do. You know, all we are trying to do, all we're trying to do, and it sounds very simple, but the level of complexity is in, is in the math, it's in the code behind it, is identify medium-term trends in deep liquid markets worldwide. That is it. And actually constructed um, efficiently across many different markets, across multiple time frames with very tight kind of risk management. That's the key to our ability to be able to generate uh, sustained, diversifying performance for our clients over the long term. Anthony, everybody can find you and your business at aspectcapital.com. Best place to check everything out, correct? Exactly. I mean, there's a lot of information there. Again, if we can help in provide any kind of further information, you know, to anybody who'd be of, of interest, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be delighted to help. Anthony, it's my pleasure. And thank you for taking the time today. I Michael, I appreciate your time as well. Thank you. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, 
protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.